I want to present several examples in which the .NET framework uses attributes. I think the hardest thing for me with attributes was understanding what their purpose was. They just seem like objects that sit there and do nothing. And, and not until I actually had to use attributes in several different contexts did I say, oh, that was that was useful. So the features I'm about to show you, yes, they could be done in other ways. It would be a pain in the neck, very clumsy attributes and allow a clean solution to all the features that I'll show you. But anyway, let's get going here. I can I can make a class here. Let's class cow. I don't know what it is I have with cows. I I just like cows and we'll say public string name and we'll just make it a field and the reason I'm making a field is is because I'm about to use some old school uh, library stuff that uses attributes but st still uses attributes nonetheless public int uh, let's give the cow a weight and that's probably enough let's create a cow var Betsy gets new cow name gets Betsy weight gets I don't know Let's do 500 pounds. I have no idea how much a cow weighs. And now, let's say I want to send Betsy out to a disk. I want to save Betsy away for later use. I want to serialize Betsy. If you want to learn about serialization and saving your objects to disk or sending them over the network, that kind of thing, uh, go watch the appropriate videos on that. Uh, but for now, I just want to show you how attributes work. I'm going to make a formatter. Formatter which will write this cow out to a file for me. I could do it by hand, but I'd rather use a built-in structure to do that if I can. So new uh, binary formatter using system.runtime.serialization formatters.bind. Wow, that is quite the using, is it not? Anyway, now I have a binary formatter, and I need a, I believe this takes a stream, if I remember... I'm going to say formatter dot serialize. Come on, formatter dot serialize. And it needs a stream to do that too. I'm going to just shove it in memory. I memory stream. It's new memory stream. And if all this doesn't make sense to you, don't stress it. I'm simply trying to give you examples of how attributes come into play. I want to serialize Betsy out to memory. I could do a file. I wanted to, but it's easier to just do it in memory, and then I don't have to create a uh, a file on my hard drive. It's, oh, I got these swapped. We need to serialize Betsy to that stream. There you go. And now I can say uh, memory stream dot seek to the beginning of the stream, and then I can say var Betsy's clone. Did you see me try to put a parenthesis? S in there, that's embarrassing. Betsy's clone gets formatter.read. How about deserialize? Deserialize from the memory stream as cow. Right, I believe deserialize returns the compile time type of object. You can see object there, and so I have to say, hey, it's really a cow. I, I put a cow in there, and then we rewind, kind of like a typewriter when you write to the end of a a line on a typewriter, you have to hit the lever and go back to the beginning. That's exactly what I did here. I said, hey, go back to the beginning of the file so that we can read that cow out. And then here I can just say, hey, Betsy's clone dot wait. Let's write out the wait and let's also write out the name. And we should see Betsy here and 500 pounds right there. Control F5, run it, and oh, we got an error. Ah, boom, bomb. What's going on? Unhandled exceptions is my run Type cow in this assembly stuff. Go watch the assembly videos if you're interested in what assemblies really are. Is not marked as serializable. Oh, okay, okay. Well, let me mark it as serializable. Serializable. There we go. I just shoved an attribute on there. A dumb attribute that does absolutely nothing but sit there until the formatter will go and say, oh, let me just make sure this cow is serializable, and if it is, then I'll do all this work. And then we can run it, and we see that, oh, Betsy's clone has, has the same data as Betsy. Now you may be thinking, why did they make it do that? Why did they just allow serializable to be the default? Well, just like everything in .NET, 
if you want to do something, you have to say so explicitly, just for just for safety. Say this cow had some I don't know, passwords or usernames in it for some databases, and I'm trying to serialize it over the network, and I don't realize that I'm sending stuff as plain text over the network. That's bad, and so they force me to tag this attribute on there to be more explicit. Okay, so there's one example of attributes. Next example. Do you like how fast I can type? That was epic, wasn't it? Anyway. Uh, I'm doing a little bit of Entity Framework here, if you are unfamiliar with the Entity Framework, don't stress that either. Okay, you can go watch the videos on that if I can get around to making them. I have this context, which allows me to talk to the database. It has a set of people, and each person has an ID, a first name, a last name, and an age. And down here in main, I say instantiate me context, which is my pipeline to the database. And I just say, hey, go through all the people and tell me their first name. If I jump over the database, you can see I have this me database with a people table in it. It's pretty straightforward. I say select splat. Give me everything from the people table. That's a SQL query. You can go watch the SQL video playlist if you're really curious as to how that works. Select splat from people, and there you go. There's all the data in my database. So as I go through each person, which is one row, each row makes a separate person instanced instance in my code. I'll just scroll this to the right. Every every row of these will create one instance of this object. Then we will see Jamie and Billy Bob and computer videos, Susie Smith. Let me control F5 that. And you can see this for loop down here certainly writes out everyone's first name. So Jamie, Billy, Computer, Videos, Susie, and we're good. Now the Entity Framework is quite magical. Well, it's not as magical as it looks. There's actually a lot of reflection going on here, and, and don't stress it. If I can get to those videos, I will. But what if my database table, let's go back to my database, and uh, this is one example of many things you can do with attributes in the Entity Framework. But let's say instead of having my table named people, it was named something stupid because I work with developers that don't know how to name their tables appropriately. And, and all of a sudden, over here, this person isn't going to match the people and the Entity Framework is going to freak out and be like, hey, um, um, I couldn't find the people table so I didn't give you any data. All right. Ah, that's bad. So the way we can fix that is decorate our, well, one way is to go fix our table over here. But say there's a lot of code stuck with this table, and fixing this is going to be a pain in the neck because then we got to go change a lot of stuff. So over here I could just be adapt, and so I can say table, control dot, get the appropriate using in there, and I can give it the name here. I can say, hey, what name, what table name are we trying to, to map to? I'm trying to map to the something stupid table and now when I run this you can see hey we're getting our data appropriately because we use this attribute to tell the entity framework what the actual table name was. Now if you tried this at home exactly how I did it I actually had to do some hocus pocus in the background to remove the error but this and, and the stuff I'll explain if I end up doing an entity framework playlist but for now I'm just trying to show you here's another use of attributes and we can even do the same thing down down here in the fields where maybe first name is required, so I would say required here, you know, and maybe it has, I don't know, max length. And again, these attributes have no meaning until the Entity Framework looks at it and says, oh, you want me to save an object? Does it have a first name? Is it not null? Uh, is its length less than 50? That sort of thing. And so now I am talking to the Entity Framework via these attributes. And the, again, the attributes just sit there in my file and do absolutely nothing until the Entity Framework examines them and, and uses reflection, just like I showed you with the unit testing stuff. And, and ex using that information, it can uh, decide whether I'm doing appropriate things with my data. Okay, next example. We need to add a reference here to system system.service model. This is WCF. and I can come up here and make an interface, and we'll call it cow, because I like cows, I can say void and moo, and then in WCF, in order to make these things invocable over the internet, again, I'm just blasting you with all these different areas of .NET, don't worry about it, the idea is, hey, here's some examples of where we use attributes and why they're important, interface cow, this is going to be a service contract, I'll need the using for that, and then this will be my 
operation contract and what that means in .NET is simply I can invoke these things over the internet that's a very high level description but just deal with it and we're actually going to have to make a class I'll say it me cow and it needs to implement the cow interface I guess I should have said I cow here uh, just for conventional purposes we like to put in I at the beginning of our interfaces control dot implement the I cow yes there is the moo, and right here I'll say moo, like so. And then down here I need to make a WCF host, which you'll have no idea what this means, but don't worry about it. New service host type of Mikau. Host.add a service endpoint uh, type of iCal. iCal. A uh, new WSHTP binding, HTTP colon, slash slash, localhost, colon, don't worry about all this stuff down here. Host.open. Okay, so ideally I'm hosting the service on one end of the globe. And then at some other end, end of the globe, on some other program, I mean, I'm just going to do this all in the same program, but ideally in another program, you would say var <coughs> cow gets channel factory i cow dot create channel new wshttp binding new endpoint address http colon slash slash localhost 134 <coughs> and then I can say cow dot moo. Whew! Wow, that was, a, that was quite the example. So, over here on one side of the globe and another project on another computer, you're doing this, and I'm hosting the cow, and you will see, hopefully, that we can invoke methods via the network using WCF to abstract us away from all the sockets and stuff down below, but I'm able to invoke the moo on your cow. All right, and that's just another use of attributes. We're saying, hey, WCF, this iCow is part of a contract. Please expose it using SOA which is service-oriented architecture concepts and a lot of XML is going on underneath the hood but long story short this is a nice abstract way for us to say hey I just want an iCow and this is my operation and that's that and so if if I get around to doing WCF videos I'll go in all the details there but but nice and short I can just tag these attributes onto my types and then all of a sudden hocus pocus WCF takes over and we're good to go. If I didn't have operation contract on there, let's do a void goo, goo like that, and come down here and add the goo method to me cow. Uh, and then me, let's say control L, control V there, and I'm going to make goo the operation contract instead of moo. However, over here I'm trying to call moo over the network and and we took the operation contract off of Moo, and so we can no longer call Moo over the network. We get an error. WCF reports that, hey, uh, not supported. Method Moo is not supported on this project proxy. This could happen if the method is not marked with operation contract. Blah, 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 blah. That is another example of where we use attributes. Hopefully, well, if you do any significant amount of .NET, you'll start using attributes everywhere. And now after watching my videos, you'll realize that the attributes do absolutely nothing but are just there until something like uh, WCF or the Entity Framework or whatever framework you're using wants to use reflection, just like I did when I wrote the simple unit test framework, pull those attributes out and make decisions based on those attributes. So there you go. I could come up with several other small examples, but hopefully that's probably enough. Let's get back into the nitty-gritty dirt of attributes and see what else we can learn.